Hello and welcome to episode 89, part 1 of Awesome Astronomy for November 2019. Do not adjust your audio devices. What you hear is correct. I'm sorry to say, your tinfoil hat has failed you. Here's Jenny! Yay! I'm back! Did you miss me? Yes. No. Eh, I mean, yes, yes, yes. yes. (laughs) Of course you did. Well, they did. I'm hoping that you guys all did too. (laughs) Because, well, somehow, without me around, they managed to throw over two hours of drivel at you last (laughs) month. And yet, they have the cheek to have a go at me for going on. (laughs) I see how it is. It was in honour. It was in honour. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, I'll remind them of this next time they're asking for the annual shipment of drilling fluid, which is, you know... All for invasion purposes, of course, never because of the cold Martian nights. Hmm. Reluctantly abandoning their fight over control of the big red shiny launch button. Joining us this month as we attempt to climb the perilous mountain of knowledge is my favourite Martian, Ralph. I hate you. That's a lot of drilling fluid. (laughs) Drilling. That's a lot of drilling fluid. (laughs) And my favourite Sidonian, Paul. Hello. How how do we? Very well. Very how, good. How do you? I'm all right. You know, still getting over things. Mm-hmm. It's been all been a lot recently, uh, so hopefully yes. we can take your mind off it for the next uh, next hour or so at least. Anyway, mm. and um, and uh, am I right in thinking that quite recently I'm, I'm sounding like the host in this, aren't I? But am I, am mm. I, <laughs> I know you're hosting mm-hmm. this month, Jed. So apologies for jumping in with this, but. Um, <laughs> Segwaying in, am I right in thinking that you've now um, had a chat with your second Nobel laureate recently? Well, I couldn't unfortunately bag an interview this time. Mm. His uh, schedule was that tight I can uh, imagine. that he had no time for um, any kind of interviews or outreach stuff at all. Mm. Um, however, yeah, what I'm referring to is that Kip Thorne came to Cardiff a couple of weeks ago as we're recording um, and gave a lecture all about uh, gravitational waves, but also the uh, synergy, buzzword right there, the synergy of uh, art <laughs> and science. Oh, I hate those talks. I, I say I've, uh, I've, I've, I've suddenly hate the man. Do you know what, Syn- though? I'll let you talk about this and I'm just going to bore off for a minute <laughs> no, it was quite interesting because um he was the consultant scientist for the film interstellar mm-hmm. um so he helped them when they were trying to make a sort of realistic rendition of what a black hole might be and what a wormhole might be and stuff mm-hmm. uh so the rendition of the black hole is pretty realistic um however the uh what happens uh spoiler alert as they attempt to go through the wormhole uh that's crap that's all artistic license was kind mm. of the crux of the talk um, because the real science version basically looks too boring. <laughs> um, so what was he saying it should look like if you were going through a wormhole? I think he's just saying that it'll be uh, less of the lights and the and the jazziness and all the fantastic things. It's just kind of like um, as you were going through a wormhole, you'd be like, oh, look, I'm through the wormhole. It would just ah, kind of be right. like you just kind of pop through. It wouldn't be. Yeah, I. Do you know what? The, all the if it's not all like, singing, all dancing thing. If it's not like Dave going through the the Stargate in two thousand and one, I'm not interested. That's it. We've been spoiled by that, yeah. haven't we? Yeah. That's yeah. what we expect. It the would be like the universe. Frankly, needs to up its game. Hmm. Come on, universe! You've had thirteen billion years, fourteen almost. Yeah, look, we we did better. The moment we got special effects. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But all that's under the assumption that you can actually go through a wormhole, which you you can't basically. So yeah. says the physics. Is that because it um, collapses? Yeah, because the except the second you attempt to g- actually go through, then yeah, it'll collapse. Um, this will lead stupid, to a listener's question. Stupid universe. Stupid. Stupid universe. Stupid. Yeah, and that's fine. We can yeah. have that for next time. But yeah, it was good. It was a shame that you know I couldn't do a second interview. Yeah, that would have been nice. But he's going to be so busy, isn't he? Yeah, well, he'd. I think he's like just flown in from France and then he was flying to America the next day. 
and just you know decided to stop off in Cardiff so that um so Cardiff University they've got a new experimental gravitational physics lab and mm-hmm. so he was there to sort of cut the big red ribbon on mm-hmm. that and they were like hey seeing as you're doing that will you give your lecture and mm. um yeah gave his lecture cool and no and no doubt you had to disappear s- swiftly anyway because like you've got a new paper out or something I have submitted my paper <laughs> yeah it's not out yet it's gotta go through peer review um so i am patiently waiting or rather impatiently waiting for um reviewers to be assigned you're being Uh, peer reviewed jen i am and i've seen this paper you've got top billing on it you have yeah of course i did it's my paper it's my work it's It's exciting it's very cool it's very cool we're very proud it's exciting but you know the thing is i'm talking about it now and you watch that reviewers are just gonna like shit all over it <laughs> yeah that's be fine because then you can just one. stick it on the archive <laughs> <laughs> do you know what though people do do that people do do that they just shove things up on archive you have got to be a little bit careful yeah or just a lesser journal not everything has to go in nature or uh this one is munras we've submitted to uh monthly notices of the royal astronomical society oh yeah more old munras yeah Monass. No, sorry, Menras. It's my Welsh accent, twisting all the letters. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, I mean, I've been waiting just over two weeks now for a reviewer to be assigned, which is not unusual. So hmm. I'm just impatient because, you know, it's my first paper and yeah, I want to yeah. find out what's happening. Yeah, um, you but want to be yeah. published. Yeah, like the issue we've got is there are a lot of authors on this paper. I think I've got... 17 or 18 co-authors. Crikey. Sounds lazy yeah. to me. Huh? If you're spreading all that work around, that sounds quite lazy to me. Hey, what, you do, like a paragraph oh, each? Oh, no, no, no. It's, 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 I've done all the work apart from one person ran some code for me. Um, but all the actual coding and data data munching, I've done. Oh, the others are just freeloaders, are they? Well, some of them are. <laughs> I hope none of them are listening to this. No, they won't it, be. it's very interesting um, how people get co-authors onto paper. So some of them it makes sense. Like for example, my supervisors are co-authors because obviously without their guidance, I wouldn't have been able to do the paper. Um, the guy who ran um, ran some code for me, he's obviously on it. Um, the person whose data we're using, they're on it. Um, then there's this whole political thing where because the data is part of a large consortium, um, in order for my paper to sort of go out to be peer reviewed, it has to go through that consortium first. And so um, people in that consortium look at your paper, they make suggestions. So some wow. people got added to the paper because they were like, hey, have you thought about doing this test? And we were like, hey, that's a good idea. Let's try it. Mm. Um, yeah. And then some people go on there because they chose to correct my grammar and by correct my grammar i mean suggest that i change a colon to a semicolon um yeah don't a semicolon even... should not be entered into lightly you got to know what you're doing with those things yeah mm, Grease yourself. Yeah. so basically every and his dogs on this paper except paul and me <laughs> yeah do you want me to put you in the acknowledgements i can probably yes, do please. that Blood, bloody right <laughs> please. bloody right we made you we made you we put you there <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't destroy you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, oh, it's interesting, the, the whole politics of it. But uh, yeah, a couple of uh, acknowledgements uh, wouldn't go amiss. All right, I'll, I'll run it by my supervisor once it comes or, back or from dedication. the peer review. I think a dedication. dedication. This is dedicated yes. to... Yeah. I You uh, can't do dedications in paper, but I tell you what, I can put you... When I do my thesis... Uh, there's you have a whole page of acknowledgements, you know, where you're like, oh, and I, I thank. I'm not my interested cats. in a thesis. I want something published. They're not uh, going to publish your thesis, are they? Um. Well. I mean, it this, has to go. There's inherent uh, risk in that. This is going for publishing. We want acknowledgements yeah. in this. I mean, come on. I mean, apart from the fact that you could be the only person that writes a paper on the existence of Martians, and the only person <laughs> with verifiable proof of this. Yeah, this is true. All right, I'll uh, I'll see what happens when it comes back from the reviewers. Yeah. Is Lintock going to be one of the reviewers, do you think? Well, this is a thing. Because there are so many co-authors, um, and there are also people who are in the acknowledgements because they send us data to compare with and, and things like that, um, 
it's quite difficult for them to find uh, someone to review it. Mm-hmm. Mm. Could be Lintot. I mean, it is Galaxies. Yeah, because well, he's finished his book now, hasn't he? So uh, he has he's got finished some time his book. On his hands. And it's out. And I had a secret early copy. Ooh. 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 Did you? Was it an early copy? I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, well, I had it before it was released. Um, Get you, gosh, she's such a in crowd now. I know. Oh. I know. Yeah, this is Lintot's new book, uh, The Crowd and the Cosmos. It's very good, actually. I will be fair. Um, I, it's available to buy now. It's in bookstores and it's on Amazon and stuff. Um, and, you know, the, the sort of prerequisite on me being able to get this early copy was uh, that I would do a review. Uh, uh, this is me doing said review. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just to make it clear to Lintot's people. Um, uh, it's very good. So the the book And follows... is this an unbiased review? Is, this, is there no bias in this at all? This is your actual thoughts on it? Yeah, this is that's the what kind I... of people we are on this show. We we yeah. don't do platitudes and things like that. He drank all my beer at Astro Camp, so <laughs> uh, I, there, there's going to be no no favoritism here. Yeah, no, I got to be fair. It, it is enjoyable. Um, it follows basically the story of Galaxy Zoo. Um, oh, yeah. So it's how the idea of Galaxy Zoo came about. Well, not just Galaxy Zoo, also the whole Zoo universe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and sort of how how it came from a from an idea when he was a postdoc. Um, you know, and then it follows the story through to sort of where we are now. Um, and it's really interesting because it's semi autobiographical I would say in the sense of it doesn't you know wax lyrical about his childhood or anything mm. but it does kind of have stories of his personal journey as Zooniverse was being developed um, and things that he got up to while it was happening but it's also got um, lots of bits of astronomy history that I didn't know about um, that sort like. of link into Zooniverse so it's kind of um, the book is I would say at times it's not it's non-linear, so it kind of wanders off a little bit. But I think that's just an academic's mind, right? It goes yeah. off on these little meandering paths. But I think because of that, it's almost like it's weaving a little web. Yeah, that is mm-hmm. the story mm-hmm. of Zooniverse, and I think the whole structure where it, because it kind of wanders around a little bit is very illustrative of how things actually occur in real life science. And that's a subjective thing for the reader as well, isn't it? Because some people will like that kind of style and other people yeah. won't. And you, you can't do anything about that. Oh, no, I, no, I, no. I, I like a good non-linear you, book. You like a meander. Mm. I do like a meander. A literary, literary I, I, meander. I want an author to take me on a like whole journey around in a circle and mm. up and down. And yeah. I, I don't want just like begin, middle and end. That, that's like key stage three. GCSE and then I woke up stories hmm. no, I, I want <laughs> yeah. I want everything everywhere. too much of an intellectual for, for linear, linearity yeah, absolutely <laughs> brain like this needs complexity layers it is good though ideally on three different time zones oh, yeah <laughs> it is good though I would recommend stick it on your Christmas list or buy mm. it for someone else yeah um, what, what, what was what was your one of your top top kind of bits of the book what's 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 kind of yeah because you mentioned about things there was things that you learned from it mm. what, what's your top there moment? probably aren't many astrophysicists that that learn much from b- mm. books on astronomy Give so it. so what were your top things that you learned from it so um i didn't realize how early citizen science because you know that's what the whole universe is about actually yeah. began like well, it started first... with seti at home didn't it uh long before that Oh, Ooh, really? Before, Ooh, yeah, on. hundreds of years ago. Whoa. Oh, wow. When uh, someone was... I can't remember his name now. Dave. Because um, I read it a little while ago. Uh, but someone was trying to work out the um, uh, the physics of like projectiles and ballistics and things. Hmm. Um, Definitely Dave. And so there was going to be a fireworks show. And mm-hmm. so the, sci- the, the scientists put out... Um, a sort of call to arms for people to go and stand in various places um, and mark if they could see these fireworks and sort of how far up they went and things like yeah. that. Oh, wow, okay. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, so that you could try and like figure out some of the physics of ballistics and things like that. Um, oh, cool. Wasn't. Yeah, that, that is it's insane. I, I love yeah. stories like that. That That's... I, this Lintot book's on my list. Mm. That's, that's yeah. the kind of sh- I need. Mm. Yeah, exactly. It was like yeah. really random stuff that I had no idea about. Yeah. And um, they did similar things with um, weather reports as well. 
going back hundreds mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. years. So I think that was a, that's the thing that sort of stuck out to me most. I had no idea that this sort of citizen science had been going on for so long. Um, so that was interesting. I also didn't realise that he's at, he's actually gone um, to Antarctica when they were sort of expanding away from um, just the galaxy's sort of side of of galaxy zoo and moving it into the zooniverse with like yeah other they scientists. do penguins mm. yeah well this is the thing it was when they were sort of starting to set up the penguin watch one um but he actually like went to antarctica um and nice um, if you can get it in it yeah. yeah yeah because he was you know exploring like all the cameras and everything and mm. yeah it is a nice book i gotta be fair i was pleasantly surprised because i had no idea what it was going to be like um but yeah, it was good. Um, it's nice. nice that it's not just like, you know, oh, this is a fact, this is a fact. It is mm-hmm, more mm-hmm. like a story. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I would expect that. I mean, he's a good storyteller. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you see him present and you, you chat with him, he's a good storyteller. His, his presentations are excellent. So you, you would mm-hmm. expect a good, a good yarn, a good tale. Yeah, I yeah, mean, if, if half good. the charisma comes off on the page, mm. then mm. then that's a good start. But I mm. actually think that um, what he's done with Zooniverse and the way that he's really grown mm. at Citizen Science and and the discoveries that you know have come from this, whether it's things like you know the Volverp or with um, uh, exoplanets discoveries, um, I I think that we are going to look back on all the stuff that Chris Lintot's done, and that will be by far the um, the thing that has had the biggest impact. I mean, it'll always be remembered for the fact that he's a. I'm speaking like an obituary. I'm really sorry, Chris, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but um, you know he'll always be remembered for the TV appearances because you know that's the the, the where people know him from. But um, I I think that what he's done with Citizen Science, apart from the fact that it's entertaining for a lot of people, but also the fact mm. that you can crowdsource yeah. this. Is going to be such a, an important legacy. Yeah, 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 completely, completely. As a, there's got to be a knighthood in there somewhere, isn't it, eventually? <laughs> well, he's a professor yeah. now, isn't he? And he's I think he's only four. about eighteen. Is he eighteen yet? <laughs> <laughs> he's actually, he's actually younger than us. He's not. He possibly, is he? he <laughs> like he is. <laughs> he's younger than me. <laughs> so our professorships must be in the post. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. But there yeah, would recommend The Crowd cool. in the Cosmos, Lintot, Marvelous. on Amazon, all good bookshops. Oh, the also, the other very nice thing is that it's got some coloured images in the middle. That it's also peppered with some black and white images all the way through. But once you take the desk cover off, it is a really nice looking book. Like the desk, desk cover is lovely, don't get me wrong. But you know, like when you take the desk cover off a book, you're like, oh, that's sh- no, no, I can't say I have. Oh. No, then it looks like <laughs> a normal you, book. Have you which never is taken beautiful. the disc cover off a book? You're like, oh, that's really disappointing. No, because it looks yeah. like a book then, which is beautiful, rather than having the garish colours on on dust jackets. Right. Well, then, you guys, your balls are going to absolutely explode when you take the disc cover <laughs> off. Oh, really? This book wow. is a very pretty looking book, and so- I. Uh, I appreciate stuff like that. So there's no better review than that. Get get Lintot's book for Christmas. It will <laughs> make your balls explode. Your balls. explode. <laughs> <laughs> Christmas Day, explode your balls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I now I now want to see just people tweeting them taking the dust cover off on Christmas yeah. morning. <laughs> Hashtag exploding balls. <laughs> Come on, listeners, you can make this happen. Come on. I'm looking at you. Yeah, just hashtag I... Lintot's exploding balls. <laughs> Get on with it. <laughs> I say, I'm, I'm looking at you, Steve Brown. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Lintot, of course, uh, his first name is Chris, isn't it? <laughs> Oh my god, you need to stop with these awful segments. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at least the late top one, you 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 tried, but this one, Jesus what? Oh, that that is the most awkward segue ever. <laughs> I, I actually cringed. <laughs> my my balls didn't explode, they shrank. <laughs> and um Chris Lintot's book's not uh, not priced at fifteen thousand pounds, is it? No, <laughs> No, it's not. Oh God, I think you need to be quiet for a little bit. Okay, I'll go and pour another wine. <laughs> what? Oh God. Oh, what, Ralph? 
is uh, trying to allude to um, is that so at the um, at the start of last episode, uh, you know, Ralph made an announcement of why I wouldn't be here um, and about the fundraiser for my friend Chris, who unfortunately passed away in China. Um, but I just thought I'd give you all a little bit of feedback about that in case anyone did um, choose to donate. And thank you if you did, because we managed to raise over £15,000 um, for him and his family um, to help with the repatriation costs and memorial service costs and and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so thank you for anyone who listens and donated because it meant a lot and it meant that we could give him a really nice send off and it also meant that we could get him back in a timely manner. So thank you for that. Right, according to Ralph's suggestion, I should uh, introduce this section as uh, the world of emails. (laughs) (laughs) World of emails. I suppose it comes through on the World Wide Web, right? So maybe somewhere in like his broken synapses, there's a weak connection going on somewhere. I don't know. But Ralph, tell us what people have been hollering at us. Well, okay. But first, I want to know: Is there anybody out there that does jingles? Because if so, we want to we want a really cheesy jingle for World of Emails. <laughs> oh, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Yeah. I, I asked Star Soulsman, who does the theme for the show, to do as a Christmas one, but I've not heard back from him yet. So I'm guessing that's not going to happen. But um, <laughs> if um, uh, if anyone wants to do, isn't there just as like a, a jingle, jingle bells button that we can just put over the top of like the normal theme tune? Oh uh, yeah, we could do like sleigh bells or something, couldn't we? Just uh, do yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, and the sound of someone collapsing on the sofa in a in a surfeit of turkey and uh, flatulence. Uh, like... <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the sound of exploding balls once they unwrap uh, it. Yeah, yeah, it oh, this is an intense book. What Ooh. happens if I take the dust cover off? <laughs> <laughs> And if your balls do oh, explode, balls. please uh, please tweet us and let us know what it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> Although we may know ourselves when we take the dust Which is a nice segue into our next next series of emails. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this is a reasonable is... segue into the emails because it's about exploding things. Well, exploding imploding things, I guess. It's about exploding balls. So, yeah, we, we've had a, a number of suggestions from many of our good friends for a better name for a pair instability supernova, which is a star so massive that the temperature in the core is so great that photons in the core can form electron-positron pairs, which annihilate. Uh, our good friends out there have all been sending in lots of, uh, lots of um, suggestions for a better name for it than pair instability supernova. I mean, when you've got magnetars out there and you've got pulsars and you've got blazars and what else have you got? Wonderful quasars and everything like that. Why have we got pair instability supernova? That's that's just lame. So, <laughs> better suggestions. Um, we have Death Stars from our friend Andrew Osborne, which is pretty good. And it's got mm-hmm. a nice um, uh, Star Wars ring to it. We have a Sui star, I like as in one. a suicide star. I like it's good, that isn't one. it? I like that one. It's slightly, yeah. it's slightly dark and inappropriate. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> and that comes from our friend Sam in Arizona, who mm-hmm. may or may not have a second name, but he didn't give us that. We have Annihilatar from our friend Steve Brown, who also suggests Destructar and completely f- star. But, oh, um, I like, but, yeah, but I'm not great. sure that I one like call it a C- You call it a CFS. Oh, that's good. You yeah, really CFS. Like, yeah, the CFS. And people say, what's CFS stand for? Can't tell you. Well, <laughs> so, I can tell no, you, but you The thing is, that it. sounds too similar to DFS. What, the um, the furniture place? Yeah. Yeah. The sale is always on at CFS. <laughs> I like an Isletar. And, as it, as it turns out, Jackson Smitherman, who has the coolest name I think I've ever mm. heard since our good friend... Miles Hendricks. Yeah. He's got a cool name mm. too. Uh, Jas- uh, Jackson Smitherman from South Carolina also, and independently, I imagine, suggests an Isle of Tar. Oh, this is, that's got to be the one that's so, going forward. I, I yeah. love that one. I think that one's great. Yeah. And our good friend Scott Jorgensen from Michigan considered obliterating, obliterating over. Blish- obliteration over. Obliteration yeah, over. Obliteration over. Yeah. As the stars obliterated without trace, but thought the onomatopoeia wasn't there, which, I mean, there's no better word out there than onomatopoeia. That's just beautiful. <laughs> it is. So he went with devastation over, as oh. it just sounds meaner. Yeah, oh, that's like a that. good one. Yeah. 
Uh, he also says, given the state of politics in his poor tormented country, uh, things that sound mean are sometimes uh, what we have an ear for. Um, but uh, uh, what do you think, guys? I mean, I, th- I think for me, it's between devastation over and an isle at all. Mm-hmm. Mm. I like Sui Star, though. Oh, yeah. You like Sui Star? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't know about you guys. I think that, I mean, we had some suggestions last month. We had some suggestions this month. Shall we give it another month to try and soak up the rest? And then, and then, and we, then we're we'll, going to email, we're going to send that letter, we, aren't we? Yeah, we're going to get get people to change the name from... And say, yeah. IAU, motherfuckers, come yeah. on. Mm-hmm. Yep. Get it's with completely it. star or nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right, on to the news. There's actually been a hell of a lot going on this month from all corners of astronomy. We've got a lot to get through. So without further ado, it's Ralph. Me! So, um, late last year, I think we covered the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder radio telescope spotting a fast radio burst. Well, the European Southern Observatory decided to use a battalion of their scopes to take a look and found that the radio pulses passed through the halo of a massive galaxy on their way toward Earth. Now, this finding allowed astronomers to analyse the radio signal for clues about the nature of the halo gas and found that it might well be useful as a new astronomy technique because the passage through the halo lasted less than a millisecond, meaning the blast of cosmic radio waves came through almost undisturbed, suggesting that the halo has a surprisingly low density in a weak magnetic field, something we couldn't have detected otherwise. Now, the lead, Javier Prochaska, professor of astronomy and astrophysics at the University of California, Santa Cruz, said... The signal from the fast radio burst exposed the nature of the magnetic field around the galaxy and the structure of the halo gas. The study proves a new and transformative technique for exploring the nature of galaxy halos, which is pretty sweet, even if they are difficult to detect in the first place. That is a cool little bit of uh, serendipitous science right there. So next for me is a return to our second favourite interstellar visitor, Comet Borisov. Now, this is the comet that was spotted by an amateur astronomer this year that turned out to be the latest of only two detected objects that entered our solar system from elsewhere, the first being Paul... (laughs) ...discovered in 2017. So, not messing around... We've stuck Hubble on it, and it turns out that in the words of David Jewett of UCLA, leader of the Hubble team who observed the comet, whereas Oumuamua looked like a bare rock, Borisov is rarely active. More like a normal comet. It's a puzzle why these two are so different. Now, in the Hubble image that you can see online, the icy coma does seem to confirm the comet designation, and I think we've always referred to Oumuamua as an asteroid. Yeah, I think now, so. Amaya Morrow Martin of the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore went on to say, because another star system could be quite different from our own, the comet could have experienced significant changes during its long interstellar journey, yet its properties are very similar to those of the solar system's building blocks. And this is very remarkable. I love this story. Yeah, but that is so interesting if everything is the same everywhere. I know, I know. And finally from me uh, is a story about Hygieia, which is the fourth largest asteroid in the asteroid belt after Ceres, Vesta and Pallas. Uh, Because astronomers have been looking at this asteroid with the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope in pretty much unprecedented resolution. Um, And they've constrained its diameter to just over 430 kilometres, but crucially found it to be almost spherical. And what's so important about that? Well, back to balls again. <laughs> exactly. And the classification of balls. Uh, to be classified as a dwarf planet, it needs to orbit around the sun. Check. Needs to be not a moon. Check. And where it differs from planet designation, it doesn't need to have cleared the neighbourhood around its orbit of debris. Yeah. The final requirement is that it has enough mass for its own gravity to pull it into a roughly spherical shape a planet needs to be spherical a Ooh. dwarf planet needs only to be roughly spherical and now we can say Hygieia is so a reclassification is likely given us five objects in the solar system designated as dwarf planets 
a further four that seem to meet the criteria but are too far out in the Kuiper belt to be sure just yet. And now, the smallest of them all but still meeting the criteria, Hygieia. Yeah. Isn't that oh, sweet? That's so that exciting. Sweet. That is nice, isn't it? It's not often that we have kind of... I feel like that's quite a big discovery in our solar system. Hmm. It's not very often that we get, like, big things in our backyard, like big discoveries in our backyard. That's how I feel anyway. It's, it's yeah. like, hmm. you know, when they suddenly found all those <coughs> moons around Saturn or, you know, when they find more moons around Jupiter, I'm just like, oh, this is so cool. It's like, you know, stuff that we didn't know about yeah. our nearby universe. I love yeah. it. Yeah. The thing that surprised me most about it was... How has it taken us lo- so long to discover this? I mean, the, given the gargantuan it, telescopes that we've got, it, and Hubble's been there for God knows how long, it's we've only just got round to looking at this object. It just shows you how big the solar system is. And how we, much stuff there is to take we, a look we at. We forget important. how big just our neighbourhood is. Yeah. It and this, this is our neighbourhood. This yeah. is between yeah. Mars and Jupiter. Yeah. It's massive. That is also, it's very cool. Whoever gets time on a telescope is very dependent on the committee that are assigned in the time. If the team is largely made up of, say, extragalactic astronomers, they're probably going to push for yeah. a lot of the extragalactic proposals to go through. If yeah. the team is made up of, you know, solar system astronomers, then more of those are likely to get through. It shouldn't matter, but you can t- you can bet mm-hmm. your bottom dollar that it bloody well does matter. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know... That's an Americanism, Jen. We don't say bet your bottom dollar. We say bet you a pound to a pinch of shit in the UK. Pound to a pinch of shit. I like that. That's a good yeah, one. But the I, thing is... In fact, you... that's, that's my, my, my mum always used to say pound to a pinch of poo when, when I was little. Pound to a pinch of poo. <laughs> You've got to throw a few Americanisms in there just to keep our American listeners happy. So that's it now for the next six months. You don't get another one till after Christmas. And that's about two thirds of our listenership as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and now for something completely different. Paul. <laughs> I was so hoping you were going to do that. Well, you, you said now for something completely different. Um, uh, so, my first is an interesting story about dark matter um, and a surprising result in the universe of spiral galaxies. So, as a bit of a background, it was initially thought that spirals uh, could be much bigger than the Milky Way or Andromeda. That uh, We observed that the rotation speed was in proportion to the visible matter, so that's, that's where we were. And I, aha, I hear you cry, what about dark matter? Well, the rotational speeds of spirals indeed differ from the prediction based on the visible matter, hence the predicted presence of dark matter. Uh, but the variations in speed still seem to be in proportion to the visible matter, suggesting that the amount of dark matter changes in a similar proportion. So it doesn't matter what you sort of think about dark matter. Um, the, the rotational speed is different compared to how much visible matter, but it, seems, it still seems to change in proportion to the amount of visible matter. Um, and that's where we kind of were. And then the series of, of observations recently that showed that spirals, first of all, can be bigger. Um, and a lot bigger. Uh, and recently it became apparent that there's a class of super spiral galaxies which are 10 to 20 times more massive than the Milky Way. Um, mm. So That's insane. It's insane. It's huge. Um, then we have a team led by Patrick Ogle of the Space Telescope Science Institute in Maryland who's used the SALT telescope, which is the South African large telescope, to look at the rotation speeds of these super spirals and came up with a really surprising result. Uh, these galaxies are spinning much faster than expected. Mm. Mm. In fact, they're flinging stars around them at speeds of up to 1.25 million miles an hour. Or 2 million kilometres an hour in new money. That's three times the orbital speed of the sun. Whoa. But, but what, what it's, it sort of comes down to is that Based on the size of these galaxies, we had a sort of prediction of how fast they would be rotating. Based on what we kind of know about dark matter and and what what the proportion should be and how fast, and it's a lot faster than was expected. So what this this tells us um, is that well, it's just there's more dark matter in these galaxies as a ratio to the visible matter than in your more average spiral like the Milky Way or Andromeda. Hmm. Um, so. This, this is a curious result. There's lots of follow-up observations to do, but these things are spinning a lot faster 
than our kind of what we know about spirals generally seems to suggest. So it does suggest there's a lot more dark matter in these things uh, that is clumped together, that the, these things have gathered more dark matter than, than they should or or kind of based on our predictions and what we know of other spirals. So lots of uh, observations to go on that um, to kind of back that up and, and explore it further. But it does appear to be another nail in the ever more extensive coffin of MOND, M-O-N-D, which is, of course, the modified Newtonian dynamics, which is the, the theory that just kind of tries to explain it without dark matter. It just doesn't fit the result. MOND's predictions don't fit the result. It's another sort of mm. chalk up for dark matter, essentially. So next up, we're much closer home with our evil hellish twin, Venus. Q holds a romantic twist on this devil planet. Ah, lovely. Well. Wow. Turns out Holst may have been giving us a decent aural description of Venus until just 700 million years ago. New simulations from NASA's Goddard Institute have shown that Venus may well have had a life-friendly, stable environment until there was a planet-wide volcanism resurfacing event that filled the atmosphere with CO2 and turned Venus into the vision of hell we see today. Huh. It's thought that the planet-wide event occurred because Venus has no plate tectonics, so unlike Earth. Uh, which to release the pressure in the mantle. So like Earth, um, we we kind of constantly have this pressure valve of our plate tectonics. So you think the, the mid-Atlantic ridge is constantly allowing sort of mantle material to well up, um, and it does yeah. in other places. So the, the pressure is constantly released. Uh, on Venus, there's no plate tectonics, so it's thought that the pressure eventually built up, and it basically essentially went pop um, on a sort of huh. planet-wide basis, resurfaced the planet, pumped all the CO2 everywhere, uh, we know this happened about 700 million years ago because of the crater count. So we look at the crater impacts like we do on, on Mars and the Moon and things like that, and Mercury. We look at the sort of impacts and count the impacts and what sorts of impacts, things like that. Um, and the crater count suggests that the surface is only 700 million years old. Uh, so a team led by Michael Way and Anthony Del Gino uh, modelled the climate of Venus and have shown that Venus maintains a stable 20 to 50 degree climate for over 3 billion years. With water, oceans, and lakes, and all sorts. Blimey. I know, exactly. So, uh. yeah. So, Holst might have been onto something. Uh. Yeah. Could have been a paradise. So, the hell it is today. So, more exploration to be done of Venus then. More exploration. See what's we, there under the soil. It has been discussed recently because it has been an under researched planet. That's because everything mm. melts. melts. Exactly, exactly. The <laughs> last, crushed. the last lander was the early eighties. I mean, yeah, we <laughs> you were, we were you, children. Yeah, I mean, you, you stick down something with a massive drill on it. That yeah. drill isn't gonna. Well, that the, drill the great thing is like you drill, you drill, and you like release the pressure and resurface Venus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 we terraformed it. Oh, <laughs> oh, bad. My bad. <laughs> Um, uh, we didn't need to clean it down because we thought, ah, how can we contaminate oh. this world? It's so toxic. <laughs> so last for me is the ever-raging saga of Saturn's rings. Young, old, young, old. Well, just after the conclusion, based on the final Cassini date, remember Cassini passed through the rings several times before its death plunge, uh, suggested the rings were very young. Uh, the interpretation suggested it was 10 to 100 million years old. Well, we have a new interpretation of the same data in Nature Ooh. Astronomy that says, Ooh. no, hang on, they could in fact be ancient, even as old as Saturn itself. What? So a team from, I know, exactly, a team from the Observatoire de la Côte d'Azur. Ooh. Which, oh, let's that's face it, name. that's a nice observatory to go that, to. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and they must be right. because they you, must you want be... me to go to the observatory in the Côte d'Azur, do you? Right, I'm already they, packed. And let's, let's face it, they must be some chilled mother... <laughs> so they, they are going to be right, because they, they've got lots of wine. Yeah. And, uh, yep. yeah. yeah. And cheese. And they'll learn to say, a lot. Yeah. Shrug. And 73 different ways of shrugging. Yeah, that's, lots of shrugs. Um, that's people that know how to classify. Yeah. Um, led by, you thought that was a good name, Aurelian Creda. Ooh. Ooh. I know. Um, has looked at that uh, the mass and particle size um, data and shown that the interactions of the particles themselves, their interactions with the inner moons and Saturn itself reduces the mass of the rings and expels dust. 
giving the illusion that they are young based on the observed mass. So Creda points out that nothing forbids the rings having been formed recently with this precise mass um, and having barely evolved since, but that would be quite a coincidence. Mm. So the team conclude that the data doesn't give us an age, but that the rings could have formed at any point in Saturn's history and therefore could be ancient. So interesting mm. because the original the, the original interpretation that were young was based on their mass and they say yeah. well look there's this constant sort of expulsion so it gives the illusion that this is their mass and this is their mass but it's not true so the new story that we've saved for discussion is the discovery using the very large telescope which you know was doing some great work earlier um and it was also published in nature that for the first time, a freshly made heavy element, strontium in this case, has been detected in the aftermath of a merger of two neutron stars. This is so cool. Mm. This is so cool. This is is so cool. So when the universe was created, there was only hydrogen, helium, and the smattering of lithium. And everything else um, comes from the hearts of dying stars or is formed during supernova um, supernova explosions and there was some suspicion that um, some elements would be formed from colliding neutron stars just because the amount of the elements that could be produced in supernovae just didn't add up to the amounts mm. that we see um, and if that was the case that we would find these elements from colliding neutron stars then we'd find signatures of the elements in kilonovae which um, is the explosion that happens after two neutron stars merge now we all remember gw170817 yeah my favorite yeah. gw snappy snappy who, who can forget exactly so this was uh the we did a whole show on it actually yeah well, this was the uh, gravitational wave detection um, from the merge of two neutron stars. And um, the detection was in NGC 4993, which, for our interested listeners, um, is in the constellation of Hydra. Um, it makes a right-angle triangle, pretty much, with M83 and M68. And oh, we are star, segueing this Gamma into the Hydra. sky guide. Right? Oh, Come that's on. beautiful, Jen. It's great, isn't it? Mm. Right? So it's near to the star Gamma Hydra, um, towards the sort of the tail end of, of Hydra. Um, anyhow, so this was the, the merger that we found, and uh, the X shoot instrument on the VLT took some spectra of it um, from the UV through to the near infrared. And when they took the data, they were like, uh, maybe there are some signatures of heavy elements in this data, maybe not, not sure. And it's taken them two years to analyse the data. <laughs> and they finally found evidence of strontium, mm. which is the first time that a heavy element has ever been identified in a kilonova. And it is proof that the collision of neutron stars creates this element in the universe. And what, what I no. think is astounding about this is the fact that although it had been kind of theorised and people had, uh, not very often actually, it had, it had been thought that, you know, this could happen in um, colliding neutron stars, the accepted wisdom was some of the um, the metals are created as, as stars start running out of fuel. But pretty much all the heavy elements are created in supernovae. That was kind of the standard, wasn't it? And now... Or it's gone from theory to evidence. Yeah, by yeah, by heavy elements, we're referring yeah. to sort of anything heavier than iron, because you can you can do up to up to iron in the cores of stars. Anything beyond that, so you know, gold, things mm. like that, supernova. So the other cool thing that comes from this discovery is the fact that we now know that neutron stars are actually made of neutrons, because before this, there was no evidence to prove that what we thought were neutron stars and made of neutrons were actually made of neutrons because we can't they don't have a sort of spectroscopic fingerprint that you know elements have okay mind and, blown i did not know that yes and it the proof comes because they've detected this strontium um the strontium can only form in places where there's an excess of neutrons because the way it forms is you have a heavy atom and it has to be in an, in an environment where it can be bombarded with lots and lots of new, uh, neutrons, um, which causes it then to um, become turn into a heavier element before it can decay. So you kind of have to be in an environment where it's just like literally swimming in neutrons. Otherwise, you just won't make strontium. 
So yeah, it's kind of two birds, one stone. We've found out, yes, you can mix strontium in this way. And oh, BT dubs, neutron stars are actually made of neutrons. <laughs> so brilliant. Brilliant. Sky guide. Sky guide for November. There we are. We don't need a jingle. We just need me. <laughs> just stick some little, you know, Lars and R's in the background of that. Job done. And am I not right in thinking that November's the best month? It is the best month. Not just because it's my birthday month, <laughs> but because it kind of marks winter truly being upon us. Um, we've got the long dark skies back and all the delights of the winter constellations. So... Dust off that telescope, dig out your thermos, because it's time to go stargazing. Oh, and if you have a go-to mountain, you're in the UK, remember that we're back on GMT. It's not British summertime anymore. Good point. <sighs> Bloody GMT. Yeah. Oh. Stupid time change. Yeah, well, it's going, isn't it? I hope so. Hmm. I hope so. BST all the way. Sod the farmers. The farmers. Anyway... Let's have a little whiz around the neighbourhood. Uh, planet-wise, don't hold your breath. <laughs> uh, Mercury, Jen will cover in a moment, but the rest are a disappointing collection of layabout planetary reprobates, frankly. <laughs> uh, Venus, you will struggle with in the post-sunset sky and is probably only for the sociopaths. Uh, Jupiter has completed its 2018-19 apparition and won't be back for a while. Saturn is an early evening catch. Uh, so see it while you can, but uh, it will be a very wobbly target low in the sky in the evening. Neptune and Uranus are there to be seen, certainly in the first half of the night, but you're probably not going to set your evenings astronomy alight with them. Uh, and Mars is just visible before dawn as it begins its next apparition. And to fill you with unbridled joy, um, it is over a year before Mars's opposition, mm. so don't expect much. Mm. Uh, instead, try your hand at comet hunting, as there are three for you to have a look at in the November sky. So we've got 2017 T2 Pan Stars, 68P Clamona, and 2018 N2 Asatan. We never agreed how that was said, was it? Start your evening with Clamona, which is a periodic comet with a, a 10.8 year orbit. And um, sounds like a sexually transmitted disease or like a fungal e infection. When I, was, when I was writing this, I was like, this sounds like an STD. That's <laughs> <laughs> exactly my thought. Like, oh, I've got Clamona again. <laughs> <laughs> is that Dorothy? She gave me Clamona. Um, anyway. <laughs> um, it's uh, a periodic comet with a 10.8 year orbit. Um, it's in Sagittarius in the northwestern part of the constellation at the start of the month uh, moves into Capricornus during the second half of November it was Mag 11 in September um, and while dimmer now should still be a decent telescope target next move on to the pan stars uh, as it moves to Auriga it will pass clusters 36, M36 and 38 and is Mag 10 so make a nice visual and imaging target it is moving towards Perseus at the start of December uh, then have a look for uh, in Andromeda, which will be a good target at the start of the month, as it will be just three degrees from M31. Uh, that's the that's the Andromeda galaxy for people who like words. Um, <laughs> and if you need more solar system, don't forget that asteroid Vesta is at opposition on the boundary of Taurus and Cetus on the 12th and 13th at magnitude 6.6. .6. It's a good little binocular target to watch over a few days, see it move. Jenny. So, although, you know, I'm sure that that means so much to many listeners, if you do want to look at that <laughs> comet, it's spelled A-S-A-S-S-N. Because I figured... Yeah, that's so sad. <laughs> that's sad. Um, <laughs> I think you nailed that, Paul. Yeah, you nailed it, exactly. So the 11th of the month brings us a rare celestial treat, a transit of Mercury. The transits of Mercury happen more frequently than those of Venus, but your next opportunity is not going to be for another 13 years. So if you're in the path of this one, I highly recommend you take a peek. So the entire transit will be visible from South America, also the east coast of North America, uh, most bodies of land within the Atlantic Ocean, um, even the westernmost coast of Africa. Um, it'll be partially visible from nearly all of the rest of North America, most of Africa, Europe and parts of Western Asia. 
and even a tiny part of the transit will be visible from New Zealand. So, oh, it's nice to throw them a bone, isn't it? Well, it's you know, why not? New Zealand, give them a little scrap. Yeah, why not? How many listeners have we got there? About eleven. F- them. Yeah, yeah. Let's just throw them a little thing. Well, yeah, you can have a little bit. You can have a little bit. Yeah, of that's in there for just you, listeners from New Zealand. I'm going to look up now because this depends on whether I care about you or not. <laughs> Anyway, so the transfer begins a little bit after 12.30 universal time and the exact moment um, that the transit will begin varies by a few minutes depending on where you are in the world. And the transit will last for about five and a half hours, so you do have a pretty large window of opportunity to have a look at it. So if you do choose to view this amazing celestial event, please, we cannot emphasise this enough, use proper solar viewing equipment. Never look at the sun directly with the naked eye or a naked telescope. You will cause permanent eye damage. Always use a solar telescope or solar filters. So remember, Mercury is very small. It's going to appear much smaller than a typical sunspot on the surface of the sun. So if you're looking at the sun and you're like, is that tiny dot Mercury? Give your telescope a wipe. And if that tiny dot is still there, yeah, that's probably it. So transits of Mercury and Venus are of great scientific value. Historically, they allowed the first estimation of the distance between the Earth and the Sun in the 1770s, and then subsequently the rest of the solar system. The idea is based around the principle of parallax. So uh, wherever you are right now, pick a distant object and hold your finger up in front of it. Are you doing it? Are you doing it? Yeah? Other way round, you rude people. So The other finger... Hold your finger up in front of that distant object. So Not that finger. No, the clean one, not the... And don't put it there yeah. either, <laughs> disgusting people. So, Filth. looking at your distant object, close one eye and then the other eye and you should see your finger move. Now, it's voodoo. She's a witch. <laughs> now, this is because your eyes have a, di- you know, a certain distance between them and if you know this distance and you can measure the angle between each eye and your finger, you can work out the distance to the faraway object using some trigonometry. Now, imagine that your eyes are two astronomers on the surface of the Earth, your finger is Mercury and the Sun is the distant object. So careful timings of the start of the transit um, measurements of the transit path and some trigonometry can then be used to figure out the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And remarkably, the value that was calculated for the Earth's sun distance over 250 years ago is actually within a few percent of the value that we use today. Now, transits of Mercury were also important for helping to prove Einstein's theory of relativity based on tiny differences to the observed elliptical orbit of the planet compared to that predicted by Newtonian physics. And I think because I've waffled on about it so much, Mercury is going to be our object of interest for this month. So, because I've talked about the transit, these guys are now going to give you some facts about Mercury itself. Ooh. So, factoid numero uno, as Jen would say. Uh, Mercury takes 88 days to orbit the Sun. For every two orbits, Mercury rotates three times. It's almost tidally locked to the Sun because of its proximity to our host star. Hmm? Ein factoid zwei! <laughs> I'm doing that for the German listeners. <laughs> I'm sure they'll really yeah, appreciate really that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Mercury is one of only two planets in our solar system without at least one moon. The other, Venus. Uh, factoid tree, for anyone who's listening who's Welsh. Uh, Mercury has been known about for thousands of years. Of course, it's only in recent history that it was recognised as a planet, but the first mentions are believed to be from around 3000 BC by the Sumerians. Hmm. That was for our deaf listeners. Although Mercury is the closest <laughs> planet to the sun, Ralph, you it's not the do hottest. That. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> oh, God, we're going to get cancelled. We're going to take us off. We'll ban us no more. (laughs) (laughs) All publicity is good publicity. (laughs) Although Mercury is the closest planet to the sun, it's not the hottest planet. Yes, Sky at Night magazine was wrong. However, it does have the largest temperature range of all the planets because it doesn't have an atmosphere. Temperatures range from minus 170 degrees Celsius to over 430 degrees Celsius between the day and night sides. Top that one, Paul. 
Um, Fact away, blah, 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 uh, for, no, for our no, Esperanto no, no. listeners. <laughs> I thought I'd just do it sensibly. Factoid 5. Only two spacecraft have ever been sent to Mercury, Mariner 10 in 1974-75 and Messenger, which orbited the planet between 2011 and 2015. Bepi is due to arrive at Mercury in 2025 and will help us understand the origin and form of this enigmatic planet, while also verifying Einstein's theory of general relativity. I can't segue at all with that, so I'm just going to bluntly say, Ralph, talk some shit. Okay. <laughs> That's always an easy thing for me. <laughs> I'm going to take a look at the meteor showers that are off for this month, and despite November being a great month for meteor hunting, as it's already dark by early evening, we do have the moon to contend with, um, as, as you do most months, but unfortunately it's going to coincide <laughs> with the meteor showers that we've got this month. Now, uh, the first of this month's decent meteor showers, the Northern Taurids, peaks on the 12th of November. Now, this shower originates near the Pleiades Cluster in the constellation Taurus in the east around nightfall or the south by midnight. We not only have a full moon to piss on our chips during the shower's peak, but hopefully it'll be just seven degrees away from the radiant all night. Lovely. <sighs> The northern taurids are quite infrequent with a low hourly rate of around five, although they generally are quite bright, so you may catch one or two pieces of debris from Comet Enki. Then we have the Leonid meteor shower peaking a few days later on the 17th of November. The radiant sits in the neck of the line in the constellation Leo in the east after dark. These meteors are from the debris of 55p Temple Tuttle. They're a similar brightness to the northern taurids, but have a higher zenithal hourly rate at around 15 per hour. The 80% illuminated moon will be 45 degrees away in the constellation of Gemini, so still problematic, but get yourself a sun lounge after dark and you should catch a few. Staying in your own back garden is boring, so let's tread further afield and check out what the rest of the universe has to offer us. Paul. There's nothing boring in my back garden. Is that a euphemism? It's long, dark and damp. And it is a euphemism. Yeah. Anyway, my deep sky picks this month are a little group of targets that sit below the square of Pegasus, dangling from the star Deneb Katos in Cetus, uh, extending down into Sculptor. And at that mention of that constellation, astronomers of high northern latitudes just switched off. Don't this is your moment, people. First part of the evening, clear, crisp, cold skies. You won't get a better look or a more civilised chance than this to look at something that is more typical further south. So Dead of Katos is a star that sits in a lonely patch of sky to the left and up a bit from uh, former hull. That's right, isn't it? Former hull. I always get that wrong. I don't think it really matters. Yeah. I say formal lot, but yeah. I don't think it really matters, does yeah. it? I say formal hull. Um, mm. We'll go with that. Uh, which will be the highest star on the southern horizon, the, the, the brightest star, sorry, on the southern horizon. To its right and up a bit is Deneb Al Gedi. Don't look at Al Gedi. Wrong. All the bigly good things <laughs> in this sky guide are under Katos. So, place your finder scope on Katos and then move south until the star is right on the edge of the field of view. And here you should find NGC 247, a dim Mag 9 but interesting galaxy, which is one of the closest to Earth that isn't part of the local group. Hmm. Which is the same for the next and brighter object, which is NGC 253, which you can find by moving further south past a little grouping of stars, make a little diamond. And 247 would just be outside your finder scope, uh, so you're not moving very far. This is the larger and brighter Mag 8 spiral that's commonly known as the Sculptor Galaxy. Oh, I love that one. Yeah. Yes, love that is a really nice galaxy. It's a very, very nice galaxy and very easy to find. Once, once, once you found it, you'll kind of always find it. Mm. To complete the run, move the finder scope south and slightly east, keeping Sculptor in the finder and looking for star Alpha Sculpturus, which you should just come into the finder as you move move away from uh, the Sculptor galaxy. And here you can locate Globular Cluster NGC 288, which is Mag 9. This is a nice and overlooked example of the breed and worth tracking down. Ralph. Well, it's time to get giddy about Orion. <laughs> 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 and if you're hoping for a telescope for Christmas, you'll also be getting giddy about scanning one of the easiest constellations to find and revealing an eyepiece-filling star-forming region of space with a giant black hole at its heart. Of course, I'm talking about the magnificent Great Nebula in Orion. 
If you haven't seen this wonder of the night sky, you really are missing a treat. This is the closest star-forming region to Earth, a cloud of gas and dust swirling under the attractive force of gravity 1,350 light-years away. This gas and dust is being compressed to ignite into new stars, and that's why it's often referred to as a stellar nursery. Even under the most light-polluted city skies, you'll easily see the four stars that make up the trapezium cluster in its heart and a large patch of fuzzy nebulosity. But under dark skies, you'll be surprised at just how much of that nebulosity you'll see. It looks to me like a kind of soaring bird, and seeing it in a scope of any size highlights why so many amateur astronomers consider winter's constellations the best. There's also that black hole I mentioned sitting in the Orion Nebula 200 times more massive than our sun. To find the Orion Nebula, just look at the rectangle of bright stars, Betelgeuse, Rigel, Bellatrix and Safe that dominate the eastern portion of sky after 10pm this month. Then find what looks like the sword hanging from Orion's belt or the stars known as Alnitak, Alnilam and Mintaka. Nothing more difficult than that. Focus on the stars in the sword in the heart of the constellation and you have the Orion Nebula. Paul. To finish, we have the moon this month, which begins with first quarter on the 4th full on the 12th, last quarter on the 19th, and new on the 26th. Clear skies and happy hunting. It's question time. (laughs) (laughs) So... From our good friend, Andrew Osborne of No Declared Locale. Andrew emailed us to say, you know how allegedly there's no such thing as a stupid question? Well, <laughs> there's a thing called the solar wind. It's responsible for shredding Mars's atmosphere. So uh, what actually is it? It's a marvellous stream of particles that comes from the sun. Next question. <laughs> Okay, yeah. The short answer, Ralph's given. I, of course, am going to give the long answer. Because oh. why would I do anything else? Uh, I gave the long answer. I didn't need to use the descriptor marvellous. But yeah, it is a stream of particles uh, originating from the sun. Um, it's mostly a plasma of electrons and protons. So where a plasma is just hot, ionised gas. Uh, there's no atoms in the gas. The temperature is so great that the electrons um, can leave their atoms, um, leaving those protons behind. Um, the solar wind... Can I just say that Ralph was doing some fantastic interpretive dancing then, <laughs> demonstrating the solar wind? <laughs> leaving. He was, he was like, leaving. <laughs> leaving the plasma. It was, it was, it was a beautiful thing. Plasma. <laughs> You've got to edit this. Yeah, sorry. No, <laughs> I apologise to myself. <laughs> Get on with it, Jeff. He's going to take himself outside and give himself a stern talking to. Some <laughs> <Damn> good thrashing. <laughs> so, um, the solar wind originates from the super-hot corona, which is the sun's outer atmosphere, and the high temperatures here give the particles enough energy to escape the sun's gravity and sort of fire themselves towards the outer solar system. No one knows why the corona is so hot. Um, It's got a temperature on the order of millions of Kelvin as opposed to the surface, which is about 6,000 Kelvin. Why? Nobody knows. Massive unsolved mystery in solar physics. Um, Once the particles get to Earth's orbit, they're travelling at about 400 kilometres a second. Um, And they're actually the cause of the aurora. That's when these these charged particles are funnelled along our magnetic field lines. Um... And they cause all the lights that you can see. It's done now, though, right? Please, I do hope so. (laughs) Or is it? No, it is. (laughs) You'll be pleased to hear that we're done on that note. Are you still listening? Well... Suppose you better do the standard begging for some attention then. Please love us. Please. <laughs> and as always, you can help shape the show with your comments, reviews, space and astronomy questions and suggestions of anything you want us to discuss. So really, if you don't like the show, it's basically your fault for suggesting dual topics or not suggesting the stuff you want to hear about at all. So send your questions as an MP3 file to the show at awesomeastronomy.com and it's almost guaranteed to get in. 
If you've been affected by any of the exploding ball issues raised on this show, <laughs> then please call our helpline on Twitter at Awesome Astropod. So, until our space exploration show in the middle of the month, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening and from Sidonia Base, end of transmission.